Well, hello again. Hope you're doing well. I'm Hardleg Joe, if in you didn't know, and today I'm here to talk to you about trans athletes and women's sports. Which may seem like a strange topic for this channel, because usually I talk about uh, politics and philosophy here, not athletics. But for some reason, sports have become a political topic lately. At least 18 states have passed laws about transgender athletes, including my own home state of Missouri, which passed a law about it just a couple months ago. In fact, it was one of the only significant bills that the Missouri legislature passed all year. So despite our state dealing with uh, rampant inflation, crumbling infrastructure, a failing education system, rising extremism, widespread misinformation, increased gun violence, and political corruption so thorough that most people lack confidence in any government institution, we're going to talk about trans athletes, because that's apparently the most pressing and relevant issue at the moment. Alright, so this is kind of a strange topic, because there's actually two very separate things that are worth talking about here. One is women's sports and the effect that trans athletes can have on competition. Now, we will be talking about that later in the video because it's actually kind of interesting and there's a debate to be had on the topic. But first, I want to address the bigger issue here, which is why the hell sports are a political issue in the first place. Like, you'll have to excuse me if I seem a little bit more steamed than usual. I generally try to stay calm in these videos and avoid profanity. But this shit is ridiculous. One of the stupidest things I have ever seen politicians do. And that's saying a lot. The fact that the people who run my state would pass legislation this foolish is not only deeply troubling, it's frankly embarrassing. Like, even if you don't like trans people, even if you don't think they should be competing in sports, you must realize that making a whole law about it is not only a huge government overreach, but also a colossal waste of taxpayer money. Like, we paid these politicians to manage our state, to fix the problems we're facing. And not only did they spend our money arguing about sports, but we now have to spend even more money legally enforcing their ignorant sports opinions. It's absurd. This shouldn't even be a legal issue, and it especially shouldn't be a conservative issue. In case you somehow didn't know, these laws are exclusively pushed by Republican lawmakers. The very same conservatives who often run on a platform of small government and limited spending. Like, I live in a mostly red state. I've heard these arguments all my life. When it comes to business, they're always, Oh, well, we can't regulate corporations or raise the minimum wage. That would be removing choice from business owners. It's not the government's job to regulate the economy. But it is their job to run our sports teams. They can't tell companies to pay us a fair wage, but they can tell athletes who's allowed to be on their team. Like, how is that not removing their choice? How is that not big government stepping in to micromanage our lives? And look, if you know me and you know this channel, then you know I'm not an advocate for small government. But I am an advocate for local government. I believe in the pebble rule, which states that you should always try to solve a problem with the smallest force possible. You don't use a boulder when a pebble will get the job done. Or to put it in other words, you don't use stitches when all you need is a band-aid. You don't use a gun if all you need is a fly swatter. You get the idea. If you use too much force for a problem you're dealing with, not only will you not fix the problem, but you'll probably cause an even bigger problem in the process. When it comes to government, the pebble rule means letting local powers deal with local problems. If there's an unsafe intersection in your town, then you bring it up at the town hall, not the state legislature. If there's a problem with a highway that runs through multiple towns, then you can bring it up with the state, or the county, or whoever. This isn't just good philosophy, it's common sense. 
It's how you run things logically and efficiently. You delegate power. Big organizations deal with big problems. Smaller organizations deal with smaller problems. It just makes sense. So let's bring this back to the topic at hand. My state just passed a law banning trans athletes from competing in their public schools. Which begs the question, was the state government needed there? Is that the smallest force possible? Just how big of a problem are trans athletes in Missouri schools? Well, there are over 2,000 public schools in this state, and together, they enroll more than 800,000 students. And among all those schools and students, there are about six trans athletes. Six. In the entire state. For perspective, the St. Louis Zoo has nine elephants, which means there are more elephants in Missouri than there are trans athletes. A law regulating elephants would have a bigger impact on your life and be a more productive use of our politicians' time. Or here's another way to look at it. Last year, fireworks killed nine people in this state. Now, if we assumed that trans athletes were out here murdering people, fireworks would still be the bigger threat. And of course, trans athletes aren't murdering anyone. They aren't even hurting anyone. For all the talk of protecting girls, there's been zero injuries reported because of trans athletes. For all the talk of them stealing scholarships, they've won zero scholarships. This law is fixing a problem that does not exist. Transgender people are not out here winning medals left and right. They're just trying to play sports with their friends. Even if you consider that a problem, then you must admit it is the least significant problem this state has faced in the last hundred years. There are at least a hundred other problems more pressing than this one. Which is why it's frankly idiotic to see state politicians put so much focus on this one issue. Because even if it were a problem, remember the pebble rule. There's at least four smaller groups that could handle this more effectively. I mean, the players and coaches for one. Maybe let them decide if they want transgender people on the team? I mean, after all, they're the ones most affected by this. And if they can't decide, then you've got the individual school boards, you've got the school district, you've got the state board of education, and even those are a reach because most sports have a non-government organization that determines their rules. Like we don't use laws to establish the rules of football, the NFL does that. And unless those rules are causing widespread harm, there is zero reason for the government to get involved. Period. At best, these anti-trans laws are just a straight-up grift. They're an attention-grabbing move by sleazy politicians who are more concerned with getting social media attention than actually helping the people of this state. At worst, it's downright evil. It's using the power of our government to kick down on six people. Six teenagers. Look. I'm not normally the type to appeal to emotion. I try to make logical arguments on this channel. Arguments that hold weight even if you don't care about anyone else but yourself. But can you imagine it for one second? Like, I still remember high school. I was a straight, white, middle-class guy, and it was still hard as hell. Now, I don't pretend to know what trans people are going through, but I can't imagine that it makes high school any easier. You're already confused, stressed, probably getting bullied. And on top of all that, some politician that you can't even vote for yet is going to come down and make a whole ass law just to spite you in particular. Just to make your life that little bit harder than it already is. And for what? To distract people from their real problems. To win points in some bullshit made up culture war. It's fucking stupid. There's no other way to phrase it. Not only is this a law meant to hurt a small number of people who can't defend themselves, but it was done at our expense. 
Your tax money is being used here, not to improve the state or fix our problems, but to harass six fucking people. Like, no matter how you slice it, no matter what your perspective is, this is wrong. What these politicians have done, in my eyes, is inexcusable. They have proven themselves too immoral, too idiotic, to be in any position of power. Forget holding office, I wouldn't trust these assholes to hold my beer. They're unfit to lead a parade, much less a state. What they have done here is a misuse of our basic governing powers. It is ignorant, wasteful, hateful nonsense. And this is especially true because as I'll hopefully show in the rest of this video, trans athletes probably aren't even a big deal in the first place. <sighs> okay. So now that I got all that off my chest, let's actually talk about sports, and women's sports, and how transgender people fit into all this. But before I do, I should probably make sure we're all on the same page here. Because I know my audience. A lot of you are apolitical, undecided, or centrists. Some of you are curious conservatives, or former conservatives, trying to figure things out. Whatever the case, I'm guessing that a sizable chunk of you don't know a lick about all this transgender stuff, or why it's such a big deal. So let's just give a quick primer on the topic. I'm not trans myself, but I think I have a pretty good understanding of it. If you already know all this, then there's chapter code, you could just skip ahead to the next section. If not, I'll try to make this as quick and easy as possible. Alright, so this is a man's razor. And this is a lady's razor. You can tell just by looking at them. What's the difference between the two? Uh, color, mostly. They're both made of the same plastic, by the same company. They use the same blades, and they are roughly the same size. The lady's razor has a softer handle, and it's slightly smaller, but functionally they're both the same. Which brings up the question, why is the lady's razor smaller and softer and pink? Does it have something to do with biology? No. I mean, I could use the lady's razor if I wanted to. It works on anyone. Uh, both of them do. They look different, but the differences are just aesthetic. They don't affect the functionality. So if that's the case, why do we have two different razors then? Well, it's a cultural thing. We assume that ladies like soft pink things, so we make their razors soft and pink. And that is gender. These are gendered razors. One is manly, one is feminine, and that has nothing to do with biology or function, and everything to do with style. And it's the same for just about anything gendered. Like, let's take clothing, for instance. There's no practical reason for women to wear dresses. It's a style thing. They do it because, in modern society, dresses are associated with femininity. But it's important to acknowledge that hasn't always been the case. In ancient Rome, both men and women wore togas, or tunics if they were poor, both of which are essentially dresses. Now, pants existed back then, they could have worn them, but the Romans considered pants barbaric, that was what the uncivilized Germans wore, and no proper Roman man would be caught dead wearing pants. Or if you want a slightly more recent example, just look at the Founding Fathers. They wore stockings and powdered wigs. Not exactly a look I'd call manly by today's standards, but back then it was. My point is, ideas about gender change over time, because again, Gender is a product of culture, and culture is always changing. This is in stark contrast to biology, which is scientific. Biological sex is determined by what's between your legs. You're either male or female based on your genitals. 
It's more complicated than that. There's hormones and chromosomes and a bunch of other biological markers that determine sex. And confusingly, not everyone has all those markers to the same degree, so it's not as simple as it seems. But just for the sake of brevity, let's, let's ignore all that and say it's just your genitals that determine your sex. Now, generally, these two concepts, gender and sex, line up with each other. Most males end up liking the stuff that society says is manly. Regardless of if that means wearing a long, flowing toga, tight white stockings, or a pair of baggy jeans. And most females end up enjoying ladylike things, no matter what those happen to be. And despite seeming arbitrary, this connection can run surprisingly deep. Like, you wouldn't think that something like fashion would be a big deal to most guys. But imagine if you made a law that said all males had to wear dresses. A lot of guys would rather go to prison or leave the country. Hell, some men would fight to the death against a law that restrictive. Despite trousers being a fairly recent cultural thing, a lot of men feel extremely passionately about wearing pants and they would do anything to escape the fate of having to wear dresses for the rest of their lives. And this is where transgender people come in. These are people who form a strong connection with the opposite gender. There are females, for example, who feel the same way about dresses that most men do. They hate wearing them to an extreme degree. But it goes beyond mere clothing. They don't just want to dress like a man. They want to talk like a man, look like a man, act like a man, live their life as a man. And perhaps most importantly, they are just as passionate about that as most biological males are. Which is why, when the law forces them to act like ladies, they often end up taking their own lives instead. Because they would rather die a man than be forced to live their life as a woman. And of course, reverse cases exist as well. There are males who are dead set on living their lives as ladies, no matter what. They tend to get more attention in America, but both of them exist. And honestly, I don't see why that's a big deal. It doesn't matter to me what clothes someone wears or what razor they use. You know, whatever floats your boat. And I feel like most people, when you explain this to them, they feel the same way. Like, yeah, maybe you think being trans is weird or whatever. But as long as they aren't hurting anyone, who cares, right? That's what America is all about. The freedom to pursue happiness, whatever that may be. As long as it doesn't hurt anyone. And that is where the debate around trans athletes comes in. Because you can make the argument that trans athletes are hurting someone. Because sports are a career. You can earn money and scholarships by competing. And sports are also divided by gender. Women usually have their own leagues separated from men. And a lot of people think that this separation is for biological reasons. It's commonly thought that ladies have their own leagues because most of them are female, and males are so much stronger than females that the ladies couldn't possibly compete against them. Now, if that were true, then a trans woman would have an unfair advantage when playing in a woman's league, which would allow them to take prize money and scholarships away from women who might otherwise have earned them. At least that's the argument. As I said earlier, though, uh, no scholarships or prizes have been won by trans athletes at least not here in Missouri. So passing a law about that here feels more than a little presumptuous. Now it's possible that our politicians are just so enthusiastic about women's sports that they wanna head this off before it becomes a problem. But like, let's be real here. Do you honestly think that any of the conservatives making that argument give a rat's ass about women's sports? When was the last time they mentioned it? Like, they haven't said a damn thing about this topic until this year, when trans people became a culture war talking point. And like, 
I try not to assume that my opponents are straight up lying to my face, but I honestly believe that's what's happening here. I think the only reason that Republicans make that argument is to convince you that trans people are somehow hurting someone. They need a victim because it's the only way they can convince otherwise nice and reasonable people to support a law that targets six people. They're pretending to care about women's sports because it allows them to justify spending your tax money on stupid culture war stuff. To put it simply, it's a trick and you shouldn't fall for it. Don't let them convince you that something is a problem when it isn't. Even if you don't care about sports or trans people, you should care about some greasy politician lying to your face. You should care that you're being manipulated into fighting someone else's battles. Don't be a lapdog for some rich asshole in a suit. Have a little more self-respect. You're smarter than that. But yeah, my point is, I don't think that's even a real argument. I don't think there's any weight to be had there. But just for the sake of thoroughness, let's assume they are arguing in good faith. Let's give those suits the benefit of the doubt and pretend that they are genuinely concerned with women's sports. Even if that's the case, I still think they're wrong. Because I think the assumption that males will always dominate females in sports isn't true. Or at the very least, it isn't as clear cut as many people think it is. And that's what I'd like to explore in the last section of this video. Okay, so right off the bat, I should be clear. There are physical differences between the sexes. I'm not denying that. Males are generally taller, have more muscle mass, and higher lung capacity than females. These are objective, measurable statistics that do have an impact on athletic competition. The question I'd like to pose to you in this segment is how much do those physical differences actually matter? Are they really so significant that fair competition between the sexes is impossible? Let's think for a moment about the most basic sport imaginable. The 100 meter dash, running in a straight line with no obstacles for about 15 seconds. Now you would think that with a sport so simple that the physical attributes of the runner would mean everything. I mean, there's no strategy involved, no variables to account for. It's the same race every time. So if someone is taller, if they have longer legs and take bigger steps, then they should have a huge advantage over shorter runners, right? I mean, you can't deny the biological advantage there. It's simple physics. If all other factors are equal, then the taller runner should always win because they can cover more ground with each step. Except that isn't always the case. Look at a list of gold medalists and you'll see that their height can vary quite a bit. Most of them are around six feet, but some have been several inches shorter. If you were to watch the Olympics and gamble on the 100 meter dash, you couldn't just put your money on the tallest sprinter and expect to win every time. And that's because even in a sport as simple as sprinting, technique and skill are still much more important than biology. You don't win a race by having long legs and muscle mass. There's a very specific method to running which optimizes your speed. And the athletes who consistently win are the ones who have mastered that method. The ones who have practiced and trained until they can perform it as perfectly as possible, as often as possible. And when it comes to doing that, genetics don't matter much. There is no biological cap to determination. Males and females are equally capable when it comes to practicing and mastering techniques. A taller athletes do have a biological advantage, I'm not denying that. I'm just saying that that on its own isn't enough to secure the win, even at the highest levels of competition. So while females may be a few inches shorter than males on average, 
I don't think that really matters. Because a few inches don't determine who wins the race. Skill does. And again, this is just talking about sprinting. Not to diminish the difficulty of Olympic running, but it's still one of the least skill-intensive events out there. I mean, most sports involve running in addition to several other things. Just look at tennis, for example. You have to run and hit a ball. So in this sport, your height and muscle mass are both important. But that speed and strength mean nothing if you don't have a slew of other skills. You need the precision to hit the ball where you want it, the perception to read your opponent's moves, the reflexes to react quickly, and the knowledge of how to react to each situation. No one is born good at tennis. They become good through hard work and practice, through learning skills. And the more skill-based a sport is, the less impact biology has on it. You can see this when it comes to sports like fencing, golfing, or skiing. These aren't dominated by huge buff men because physical traits like muscle mass and lung capacity are barely a factor. Yeah, you need some baseline physical fitness to compete, but those qualities are far less important than mental traits like accuracy, quick thinking, and focus. And that's just the solo sports. With team sports like basketball or soccer, the individual athletes themselves give way to group strategies and coordination. These games are decided by how well a team works together, how they function as a cohesive unit, not which team has the tallest players. My point is, I don't think gendered categories are even necessary for the vast majority of sports. At least not for the sake of fairness. Because most sports are less reliant on peak biological fitness and more reliant on learning techniques that anyone can master. Of course, women are free to form their own leagues for social reasons, but if that's the case, then these categories really are a matter of gender, not biological sex. Which means having transgender women compete shouldn't be a problem. Now, all that being said, I do want to go back to the idea of fairness and play devil's advocate for a moment. I stated that most sports are reliant on technique over biology. I'll admit, though, that some sports may break that mold. It's possible that males do have an insurmountable advantage when it comes to relatively simple events like weightlifting or sprinting. But the further you get from those tests of raw physical ability, the less justifiable it is to divide the sport. Like, do women really need their own separate leagues when it comes to golf, surfing, shooting? Hell, even games like darts and billiards and chess have women's leagues. Which is really strange if you think about this in terms of fairness, because men shouldn't have an advantage in any of those. It's almost like these separate categories weren't made for the sake of fairness at all. And that's the real sticking point here. That's the thing to keep in mind when talking about trans athletes. People often act as though men and women have separate sports for the sake of fair competition. They talk about women's leagues as if they were formed in response to women not being able to compete. Like there was some time long ago when the women tried to play against the men and they just weren't good enough, so they had to make their own leagues. That, that didn't happen. There was never a time when men and women played sports against each other. They were always segregated by gender. In ancient times, women simply weren't allowed to compete at all, and nearly all modern sports leagues were separated by gender from the very start. So the fact is, we don't actually know if women can compete with men, because we've never actually tried it. We've always just assumed that they could not. That's one of the really interesting things that I found out when doing research for this episode. The defenders of women's sports will often claim that their view is backed up by science, but as far as I can tell, very little science has been done on the matter. The closest thing we have are statistics, 
based on the results of competitions. People will point out that the best male sprinters have faster times than the best female sprinters, and then take that as proof that all men are faster. As I've pointed out in a previous video though, those kinds of statistics can often be misleading. I don't have time to cover the topic in depth, but just as one example, one possible reason why male athletes might have better statistics is the huge pay gap between men and women athletes. When it comes to sports, men get paid a lot more than women, often 10 times more, which not only gives them a bigger financial incentive to push themselves to the limits of human potential, but it also means they have access to better resources when it comes to things like training. You know, the stuff that actually develops the skills you need to win. A man who sprints professionally can literally afford the best training money can buy. A woman cannot. That might not be the only reason men have faster times, but it's certainly a significant factor that shouldn't be ignored. To bring this back to my main point, I think there's a lot of reasons to doubt that males have an unfair advantage in sports. I'm not sure for certain, but I think it's at least debatable. And I think we should debate it. We should talk about women's sports and sports in general, and the impact that biology and societal standards have on these sports. Or rather, we shouldn't, but athletes and trainers and biologists and, you know, maybe even sports fans should have these discussions. You know, the people who are actually invested in women's sports. People who aren't involved with sports, like politicians, shouldn't meddle in things that don't concern them. And they definitely shouldn't assume that they know all the answers, and then pass laws that enforce their stupid, ill-conceived, and poorly formed opinions. Like, look, I may not be a sports expert myself, but I don't claim to be. Maybe everything I said about sports in that last chapter was just absolutely stupid. But I'm not out here passing laws about my sports opinions. I'm not telling athletes how to live their lives, or even asking sports teams to do anything. Because that's not my lane. Politics is my lane. That's what I know about. That's what I care about. That's what I spend my time studying. The only reason I'm talking about sports at all is because I'm seeing politicians go way outside the scope of their job to mess with stuff that is none of their business. I know we strayed a bit from where we started, but if you take anything away from this video, it should be that idea. Politicians have no business dealing with sports or gender. These are cultural issues. They're for us to decide. They're not society-wide problems. And the fact that they're trying to meddle in our personal lives should be very concerning to you, no matter what your philosophy is. Because if they're willing to stray outside their lane on this, then they're perfectly willing to do it in other places and with other topics. Perhaps you don't care about women's sports or transgender people. That's fine. But the fact is, these are things that Americans should be free to decide for themselves. And any politician trying to scare us into action, trying to step in and make these decisions for us, is not someone that we should trust with power. Consider that during the next election. I know I will. For now, though, I think I'm going to leave it here. Thank you, as always, for watching. If you liked this, then consider subscribing for future videos. If you learned something from this, or know someone who might learn something from this, consider sharing it around. And if you have any comments or questions, then feel free to leave them below. I'll do my best to respond. Regardless of what you do, I hope you have a good one. And until next time, stay safe out there.